Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode 284, The Great Connection, Dzogchen, and the Five Aggregates. So, Professor, can you tell us, please, why you translated <laughs> it's a great connection? Yeah. Okay, Gela, thank you so much. Uh, it was simply noticing the Sanskrit word, which uh, which I had I had noted um, noted before, uh, and I knew Mahasandhi was the word, and I always it was just vaguely in the back of my mind for many years. Like, well, why are they translating Sandhi? In the same word as they translate nishpana or nishpati, you know, in Sanskrit, for the dzogrim in the Anaxal Yoga Tantras of the new translations, and how come Sandhi is getting translated with the same dzogpa, dzog finish, as the finishing com or completion or what I prefer or perfection stage, even you can call it. And I was thinking, why do they do that? Well, there must be a meaning of that, and I just never thought again about it. And then the other day, I. I bumped into in the in the fact that in the in the fourth and fifth stages of the five stages of the Dzogrim, the perfection stage, the stage between the fourth and fifth, as you move into the fifth, which is Buddhahood, although there's an incomplete form of Buddhahood, you know, what they call a you know, the like mother and child clear light. There's still only the child clear light with the magic body in that. And then the mother clear light is when it's complete Buddhahood. But it's the Yuganada uh, a stage, which I like to call communion, not union, because the Yuga of the Yuganada, the Yuga means a pair, and the Nada means bound together. So people say union, you sort of just think of that the two merged into one. But by keeping the word Yuga in it in Sanskrit or Sung in Tibetan, Sung Juk. Sung means mutually entering each other, but the, the pair is still, is still kept. So it's this kind of, it's a, you could say, a paying homage to the, to the inconceivability of ultimate reality, that it is beyond collapsing to one side or another. And so perfection has the connotation of being the absolute, the ultimate, you know, the final. And so, but Sandhi in Sanskrit, and I was, of course, everyone knows, anybody who knows Sanskrit knows that Sandhi is the rules of grammar where one word connecting to another in a compound changes the last vowel of the previous word or consonant and the first consonant or vowel of the next word. So it's a, it means connection and to connect the two things change. And so that's what Sandhi means. And the Anuttara Sandhi, Therefore, the great connection means the connection of the absolute and the relative in the case of the Yuganada. So, so then going back to Dzogchen, uh, I will go back to one thing that's always been a mystery in my mind, of course, because I'm not yet enlightened, unfortunately, although I'm sniffing around the edges a little more after 55 years of working on it, 60 years. And... Um, but there's one thing, you know, the great Zongkapa, when he was 40 years old, he, 41 years old in 1398, he claimed after an experience that he had of complete understanding of everything. He got everything clear, this is his idea, what he would say, you know, and uh, finally understood Nagarjuna sort of thing, which means he must have been enlightened. But then he also says in colloquial tra tradition, he was surprised it was the opposite of what he expected. <laughs> and he was a great scholar since the age of five or four. 
He knew how to read automatically. He was initiated at every mandala at seven. He was a monk his life long, a mendicant, a great yogi and so forth. And, uh, and yet when he got completely clear, he said it was the opposite of what he expected. And nobody ever explains it. And I still don't understand it because he read every text and everything, every, every school. He had Nyingma teachers, Sakya Kagyu, and Kadampa teachers. And uh, he respected all of them. And, uh, but the way I think I understand it is that when you become Buddha, it's sort of like you feel like you're going to be, feel very triumphant. You're going to be, feel like God or something. And it's all going to be perfect. Everything's going to be perfect. And so you expect that. But the, and the problem is, you don't just have the wisdom of knowing the reality of everything. That wisdom becomes the infinite compassion. And your bliss is so strong, you can never have expected it. And it is so strong, you can be completely empathetic with every being who doesn't feel that way. And, and nowadays, what I'm saying is, you have all these faces like you have a super zoom. And, and the, if in your, when we're Buddha, we're going to have a screen, an infinite zoom screen with infinite gallery of beings, and not just human either. And many, many faces. There'll be a little spider face, there'll be a crocodile face, this and that. But as a Buddha, you will completely be empathetic. You'll feel everything that everybody feels. Your bliss is so powerful. It, it suffuses, it suffuses everything. And so it's like you're there and you think it's perfect. And then what do you hear? Everybody is unmuted. Everybody is unmuted. And what do you hear? A giant sound, help! <laughs> An infinite sound, help! Because even the crocodile is expecting the crocodile hunter to get it. You know, or the bigger crocodile, or whatever. You know, like somewhere there's this fear, as you say again, like red dog, fear and you know, like hope and anxiety, hope and and fearful anticipation, and and so you didn't expect that, but of course, luckily, don't think compassion is not empathetic, as some people say. That is not correct. That's just theirs is not empathetic because they didn't. They didn't go that far with it. But apparently, and this is why it's inexplicable and you can't express it because it doesn't make sense to say you're so blissed out that you can completely feel someone who's totally miserable. And you can also find in them the potential of their being blissed out also, of course, because you're merged with the clear light and you know that their, their, their agony is made of clear light, although they don't know that. So then you just, what happens to you, I think it's like the Sambhogakaya, you know? You're the Sambhogakaya, which is perfection. That's the great perfection. Body of super bliss, Sambhoga, you know? Total bliss, Sambhoga. Body, your body is total bliss. And then you, all of the, you, you, you're not disconnected, you're connected with everything because you are everything. You feel, you feel the other beings are yourself but they're not there with you yet in their knowledge. They are in their substance, but not in their knowledge. So your compassion makes you shatter in a thousand pieces. And that's called the emanation body because you then become whatever they need to see. It's like you can match an infinite zoom with the infinite zoom nirmana kaya. Nirmana means super zoom. You know, you break away into different emanations. And isn't that Turgel Gela in Dzogchen? Isn't that the Turgel part where you see everything as play of light? But then you see beings, how they are just play of light, but they think they are like a big drama. And they think they're freaking out like me, someone like me. So, and they're freaking out all the time. And so, and so then you're there for them, however they need to, however they need you to be there. So I just thought the problem, you know, that we find in all spiritual traditions, Kemal, and I think it's especially from men, especially comes from men who have a harder time connecting and, uh, and who tend to go off by themselves, like 
because they're very aggressive and they go high. Shoot off, they shoot, they get to billions, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars and they want to go to Mars and a rocket. <laughs> That's their thing. And, and so, so the, in spiritual traditions, people get a vision of the, of the absolute, of the ultimate goal as some sort of super isolation because then no one can bug them. And you know, in Vedanta, just you and Brahma, and the beings are just an illusion, the Brahmins want to say, because they don't want to have to deal with the lower castes and animals. And uh, then you have a big space experience. You feel like you're in infinite space, and you don't want to be like, wash the dishes somewhere in a sink and have to take care not to break the plates. And you just, there's no plates and no washer and no dishes and no nothing. So you're kind of but you feel like expansive, so you feel good at first before you get bored and lonely, as you say. So, so then I tried to think, well, then why did Tibetans translate Dzogchen like with the word Dzogpa instead of Delwa? Delchen, would be, which would be great connection. Tenjin Jalwa Jungwa, Chenbo, you know, Tenjung or something. So then I thought, well, Guru Rinpoche came at a time when Tibetans were all warriors and the males were very dominant, therefore, because they were conquerors. You know, Tibetans nowadays is Oman in Pemahom and Genla is there in Rome, happily curing people and healing them, teaching us. And Tibetans are very gentle and sweet and they're very empathetic and very loving and friendly, mostly. And nobody's perfect and except Buddha. And then, so at that time when he came, he was dealing with, like remember the story about Guru Rinpoche when he met the emperor and he didn't bow to the emperor. And then the courtiers, the warriors around, the generals, the nobles, they said, you better bow or we're gonna decapitate you. You know, if you have to bow to the emperor or you're dead meat. And he said, and, and, and uh, Guru Rinpoche did like this with his hand, according to the story, and flames came out of the tips of his fingers, and they all had to duck to get it not burned by the flames. So they bowed. And he just said, who's there I should bow to? And he went like that with his hand, and they all bowed. So he had to be a bit fiery with those warriors because they were violent people. So then they wanted perfection. They wanted the final goal. They wanted the final conquest which Shakyamuni Buddha faced that in India at his time also. And therefore, Arhat means Arihata, one who destroyed their enemy. You can, there's a gloss of the word saint, Arhat meaning uh, enemy destroyer. So, so that you know, military terms can be used for the, for the conquering of the highest state. So then they use the Dzogpa. And they didn't have the, sec, the later translations with the idea of Dzogrim and Kedim and blah, blah, blah. And uh, the you know, take tri and and uh, are sort of mysterious cryptic expressions for full expansion, full perfection, up to hitting the absolute, you could say, of emptiness, and then interconnecting through love and compassion with Turgel, seeing things as play of light, you know, five five wisdoms and so on. So then that's the reason that they they translated as Zolpa because it is. Although it's connection, it's connection as perfection. So the final goal is where absolute and relative are one thing, where nirvana and samsara are one thing. And luckily nirvana is stronger. And so there is no samsara, but you didn't destroy anybody and you didn't destroy even a suffering being. You just free them from suffering so they can be happy. But you don't leave them and abandon them. You have a bodhisattva vow of compassion never to abandon the other beings to bring everyone with you into nirvana. So, but that's, but you still know where they are when at the time you reach that. And then you, then all time is your time. And you, you, their future, you, you, you have that going. So you haven't abandoned anybody, but they take time. You can't force them to be Buddhas. So then it takes them time to, to evolve to that. And you're there with your compassionate emanations, nirmanas, like you, you talk, the under Gombo was an emanation of Medicine Buddha. So, but Medicine Buddha was already Buddha. And then you talk was healing people who weren't Buddha. But Medicine Buddha was still there with them, seeing to it that they were healed with maximum effectiveness. 
So that connection is a perfect connection, of course. So there's no contradiction. But I just think we Western people, most of us, are still conquerors, actually. We're still living on top of genocide and slavery and, and, and poor people and all sorts of the colonialism. We're still burning 60% of the world's energy and we're 5% of the world's population or some figure, some ridiculous figure like that. And we're matching China practically almost with the 1.4 billion people and the level of pollution that we produce in the US, not you nice Europeans. You're better ahead of us nowadays because you have that terrible war on your land and we're backward. So, you know, there's a danger that the males will think that they're going to get out of all everything by getting great perfection rather than they'll become even more connected with everything. So that's why I, that's why I went to the Sanskrit Gala and, uh, and I went to the Sandhi, which does mean connection, right? And so the great connection perfection with the thing. So not to make anybody feel that anything was left out. And that's the emptiness, and that, and that is expressed by the great Nagarjuna as shunyata karana garbam, my favorite expression, which means emptiness, the womb of compassion. Shunyata karana garbam. Not, empty, not emptiness flying in the sky all by yourself, going with Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk off to Mars, <laughs> and Matt Damon to eat potatoes. No. That means you're connected to everything and you bring everybody with you and you don't abandon a single little like cicada. It's an amazing thing Kenla, that after 17, every 17 years in the in New England, in this part of the United States, zip one trillion cicadas, you know, those kh -kh 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 at night, you know, like a cricket. They hatch, they've been sitting underground for 17 years and they all come out and hatch like a billion of them, billions. And then some other birds come and eat them and so forth. And some of them propagated and they go down in the earth for 17 more years. So we're about to be connected to billions of, they're gonna be on every tree branch and every flower plant, there's gonna be the zillion cicada. So the earth that we're connected to the earth is so strange anyway. And then today I was listening this morning before I came on to Krishna Das, and he touched my heart. And we must all pray and dedicate our effort this weekend, I think, to India. The people are dying like flies in India. It's really terrible what's going on there under the, under the silly, you know, fundamentalist uh, business that's happening there and the lack of tech, you know, technology and lack of oxygen, lack of inject inoculations, lack of everything. They're just stacked up and the bodies are stacked up in the street outside of the hospital now. It's just terrible. And uh, it is uh, Aryavarta, you know, from the Tibetans, they call it Pagyul, the land of the noble ones, where Buddha chose to exercise, to demonstrate his deeds and start his Dzogchen, his great perfection teaching. <laughs> and Guru Rinpoche also uh, was at the same time as Buddha, actually. And Hayagriva, Om Padma Sambhava Hum. So that's why I did it, Kela. I'm sorry. That's why I made that translation, uh, just for fun. And I was wondering if you, how critical you were going to be. <laughs> and I'm glad that you love it, too. But of course, we can always, it's not, not perfection. Nobody is saying it's not perfection. You know, there are some people who try to pretend that you're enlightened and then you still feel like shit. And that just means how they feel. They're just, they, they tell you, they're calling for help. Because when you're enlightened, you're going to feel so great, you won't even be, it won't even be containable within your single body. <laughs> your bliss will be like beyond body and mind, apparently. I mean, inexpressible, inconceivable. Okay. No, so over to you, Gela. That's my introduction. Okay. Thank you. And uh, well, no, a little bit my introduction finally is Genla yourself. I am so excited to be with you and to have discovered you and met you, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, I don't know how many years ago. And uh, when I first even heard your name, I was in France and I saw a little poster of Dr. Nida on the, on the wall. And I just was so excited. And I asked Sophia, you know, 
where is he? Where can I meet him? And so on. And then finally I did. Because I love that you are a guru of Ati Yoga, a really sharp, great one. And we're so honored to have you teaching us. And that you're also a doctor. And so you know the problems that people suffer and have, and you engage with them in a creative way. And that is such a wonderful thing. And I truly admire it. And I'm really grateful to have you at any time that we do. You know, I would love to capture you, keep you in the attic, but I can't because you're a free, free spirit. <laughs> so therefore, anytime you show up on Zoom or anytime, I'm just excited. So thank you, Gala. Although the thing about lucid, isn't it interesting? When you're lucid in a dream and you know you're dreaming, that means, I, I, that helped me a lot, Gala. I was worrying about, uh, you know, the lucidity the mirror wisdom being connected to hatred mm -hmm. instead of usually in Anuttara Yoga and Unexcelled Yoga Tantra, the, um, the poison of hatred is transmuted alchemically into the ultimate reality, perfection or purity wisdom. So I, it's, I'm not used to it being, but in the Yoga Sutras, the yoga tantras in the new system, you know, the it's connect the mirror wisdom is connected to um, uh, the delusion, delusion poison, you know, ignorance poison. So I was just but but the, but when you lose lucid, that means you know you're in a dream, but that means you know there is a waking state that you're not in. So there is a I, I, I tend to think of uh, enlightenment beyond expression as something like an inconceivable tolerance of cognitive dissonance, which is a simple way of saying you, you allow your mind to be so open that it can hold opposites without any effort. As you say, automatically. So when you are lucid in a dream, then you know there's another state but you don't bother with it, with the worrying about that. When you are just lucid in your dream, or you're very relaxed. And uh, so being lucid, you're completely engaged in the dream, but you do, and you don't wake up into the other state. So that's why the wonderful Chinese Taoist master, he said, you know, who without without uh, overt uh, connection to Buddha Dharma, but with that, because he came at an earlier era, but uh, then Buddhism was known in China. But uh, he he woke up and then in the daytime, and then he said, "I dreamed I was a butterfly last night, and now I don't know whether I'm a human who dreamed he was a butterfly, or a butterfly who is dreaming he's a human." Zhuangzi, you know, the great Taoist guy, Zhuangzi. So when we are lucid in Rigpa, then I guess we are not sure whether we are, we are aware so we're meditating or not meditating, as you said, whether we are in the, in the Heart Sutra, they say there's no attainment and no non-attainment at the same time. So, I don't know what else there is to say. Speechless, as you say. Of course, speechless, the thing about speechless is that there's one Zen master, it's a little Zen too, that the one Zen master I really like, he said, he said, when Buddha speaks, then the, the flowers, the gods shower the, 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 the speaker and the audience with the flowers, flower petals. So when Genla points out the relaxed letting go, it's like the, the God shower, but then the Zen master said, who cleans up the flower petals? <laughs> who sweeps them up afterwards? He says, and then he also says, such a garrulous speech, speechlessness 
filled the Dragon King's cave with scriptures. The speechless Buddha in the Dragon King's cave is filled with scriptures. He said, although he never said a single word. But they say things like that. And that's also very great because, you know, people say, I realize clear light. They say, oh, I saw the clear light, they say. But how can you see the clear light when you are the clear light? Who is seeing what? You know? So being lucid, even in the darkness, even in the sunlight, even in the moonlight, you know, you're lucid in the clear, in the clear, you know you're in the clear light at all times, I think is real far. I think. So you, you never, you know, clear light cannot be an object because unless, unless you're it. So then you don't see it actually. You are it. And being lucid, you know you're it, wherever else you're in is dreaming. So you know you're awake when you're dreaming, but you're engaged fully in the dream. So you're, your blissful awakeness is enough to be engaged in being suffering. This I think is the special great connection perfection or the great perfection connection. Two opposite things, absolute and relative. Completely rochikpa, single taste. What do you say? Are you speechless? So, Professor, can you explain us about the five aggregates? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, there's a schema that used for meditating, for looking into the cells, to find the cells. And then uh, the, the news flash was they didn't find anything. <laughs> So then they realize that the self, the capsule self is an illusion. And actually that the being is a relational, is all interrelated with everything. You know, empty of any capsule and therefore related to everything. So that's, that's, that's the aggregates. And then, then the, actually, of course, in Tantra, then we say the five aggregates are the five Buddhas. You know, usually... They connect the Vairochana with the form. And then the five sense objects are usually called the five media or the five realms, the dat, you know, datu, come. And, uh, and, uh, and the, the aggregate term in English usually used for the five uh, pumbo, pumbonga. Yeah? So you usually, so, but you can call them aggregates too, the same. But uh, the usual five aggregates are form, feeling, concept, impulse, and consciousness. And, uh, and uh, form there equals matter. Then form in the five senses is the visible object and the sound object, the sense object. So that's, it's like, those are usually called five, in English, they're usually called five realms, uh, like kam, you know, kamga. <clears throat> and, uh, or, or even medium or the sense medium. So sound and, and uh, form, visible form and smell and taste and touch the objects are really the same things, but then we divide them up according to the organs that we have. So they're kind of mediums actually, of, of uh, objective mediums or anything like that. And, they're, and the physical ones are all in the form aggregate. Then the sensation or feeling aggregate is pleasure, pain, and numbness, neutral, neutral feeling. And then the concepts are huge, all the words and images and so forth. The impulses are the emotions, you know, anger, you know, and also the sense of activity and energies. And then consciousness, is, there are six consciousnesses, mental consciousness, visual consciousness, sound consciousness, 
And this is, we call it, I call it, it's interesting, and I'm so interested that you have this scheme. It's like Ati Yoga Abhidharma in a way, you know, organizing all the, all the different ways we perceive the world through our concepts, organizing them in a, in a way of seeing, their, of, of seeing their regular way, ordinary way, and then their purified way. So that uh, the sense of connection to things fits with the details of the things. And they all become Buddhas that way. And they all become elements of Buddhahood. So people think Abhidharma is only for the tegmen, you know, the individual vehicle for the, for the single mendicant, you know, the monk or the nun. But actually the Mahayana has its own Abhidharma and, now, and, and Tantra and Atiyoga Yoga have their own Abhidharma. It would mean systematized, systematized cosmology or something like that, psychophysical cosmology. So the aggregates are, so they're just a schema, of course, that there are five this is and that's the other. But this is useful because it's like having a blueprint of a house. It's a, you have a blueprint of your capsule, as you put it, I think, really wonderfully. Your capsule is made up of these things. And then you look at them and you become aware of the full dimension of it. And then you look to find if there's this ordinary alienated and isolated self in, these, in this sort of uh, blueprint, you know, in the, in the sort of model of the world. And then you can't find it there. And then you realize your idea that it is there and your feeling even that it is there and your assumption and concept that it is there is a mistake. And it's your, it's your misknowledge. And then you, you liberate your rigpa by doing that. So just like, for example, consciousness. When I remember when my, my teacher originally taught me some of these Abhidharma type schemes, schemata, schematized things. And you think, because we think our consciousness is sort of one thing. We make a capsule out of our consciousness. And then he said, well, actually, when you look at your consciousness, very often it's just involved in your sense, your, your sight objects. It's your vision consciousness. Or then you're listening to things and your consciousness is connected to your hearing consciousness. Then you're smelling, tasting, touching things, and it's connected. Then finally, your sixth consciousness is just looking at your at your mental images and your mental, your dream, like in your dream where you see and things, it creates an inner seeing and an inner hearing and so on. So actually consciousness is complete multiplicity of things. And that kind of, I remember I felt sort of almost nauseous and dizzy when I first heard it. it made me feel like the world was spinning because by sort of analyzing, like taking it into, you know, taking it into pieces, you become aware of this sort of like a swirling confusion that we just pretend to ourselves is one thing, our consciousness. But it's actually like a, like a, it's a river, as you put it, a river of things. So that breaks down the rigidity of feeling I'm this capsule that's alienated from other things, that's a, you know, separated from other things. And um, so, the idea that in Tantra, then again, people, as you say, they just want to hear about essence of Rigpa, just pure awareness. And they, they want to isolate it, find something isolated so they can kind of recover that feeling of being separate. Whereas really, the way you're doing, the Ati Yoga is spreading through everything. You know, the Rigpa is, so, is aware of everything. And it sees the sense of them as separate things, as illusory. So they can freely move them around and is aware of all of them, look in all directions, right? Like, you know, like uh, when you imagine yourself as a magic body, illusion body with many faces, you're really looking at all directions at once out of different faces with many eyes, you know? And so that sort of shatters the, the brain organizing itself as like a, this fixed one thing, separate capsule, you know? Those are all methods of, of doing that. So I just, it's just really great, Kala. I like it. Ati Yoga, Abhidharma. It's wonderful. 
because it, you know, in a way, you never find, you know, we assume we have this fixed self. That's our capsule, you know, and then we think, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to on a seminar, I'm gonna go to have a study, or I'm gonna go on a retreat, and I'm gonna find my true self, find my identity, you know. So then Buddha says, well, okay, where do you look for it? Oh, you look for it in all of these complexities of your of your person, your mind and body and speech, your ideas and your sensations and your nervous system, and whatever it is, your elements, space, wind, fire, etc. You look all everywhere. And then you have a sense of, okay, that's those are all of the things that are that are made of. Are you, you one agrees using the schema? And um, then you look and look, and then you can't find any separate thing in there when you look. But then you never find its absence. You don't find a no self. You just don't find a self. And after a while, by not finding it, you begin to realize the, the, the not finding begins to touch your sense of the capsule and it kind of melts it. And when it melts the capsule, then we melt into Rigpa. It goes into Rigpa. And then you adjust omnidirectional, omnitemporal awareness, Buddha awareness, I think. But if, if you just say it without having, without having first dissolved that sense of the separate capsule, if you then just say, well, yeah, I just have this one Rigpa, then the danger is you will think that your illusory feeling of being a separate capsule is now a separate great capsule or something. <laughs> You're like a big capsule. You're still separate. You know? So I know someone a long time ago who was very much a fanatic about uh, shamatha and uh, really was determined they weren't going to do anything else until they had the shamatha. And then one lama said that that person would never achieve shamatha because they didn't understand guru gratitude. So I, I, and I'm so always puzzled about that because the way shamatha is presented, it's like almost a mechanical thing. Nine stages, you know, focus, more focus, returning to focus, blah, 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 you know, up to effortless focus, you know, going like that. But the way you described Guru Yoga as going through the channel of gratitude and that as opening up sort of faith in reality and gratitude for everything, kind of, and the goodness of reality thereby allowing someone emotionally to give themselves to one pointedness, you know? So that actually, even if you don't have one pointedness and you do Ati Yoga, then by working in where, we're, where you're teaching today, then that will help your one pointedness, actually, better than some sort of mechanical doing one pointedness without connection with, with the gratitude through the Guru Yoga. The actual name, they, people always call it the Mula Madhyama Kakarika. This is the root verses on wisdom. But the name of it actually is Wisdom. It's a book called Wisdom, 27 trap chapters by Nagarjuna. And a wonderful book uh, by His Holiness Dalai Lama about it. And uh, there's various translations. And the more recent ones are better. They're getting better and better. Maybe How still not perfect, but better and better. How do you call it, that book? Uh, wisdom is really the name of it. Uh, you know, Pradya Nama Mula Madhyamaka Karika, the root central way or middle way verses is what the full title is. A subtitle is the central Madhyamaka middle way verses. And what they are, are the programming for uh, meditating on selflessness and discovering selflessness. Yeah. And so... they, yeah. Mm -hmm. Analytic people, please read that book. Mm -hmm. In this question, Gala, there's a very nice thing. The, the, the Lama Govinda, who was a German-Bolivian mixture guy, 
who was a, who passed away some time ago, but he was an early writer on Tibetan Buddhism, very good one. And the Amitabha Buddha is connected with Soso Tokba Yishi, or what people will translate as discriminating wisdom or discriminating intuition. But instead of translating it as discriminating, he translated it as individuating wisdom or individuating into intuition. And that's, I think, really good because the way you could do distinguishing mind is a positive way when you, as Genla answered you rightly, that there's no right and wrong, then everything you can create as an individual thing as positive. So you, it becomes creativity. Like as an artist, you know, then you paint something that's different from, on the canvas that's different from the canvas. But that's a good difference because it shares beauty and it opens people's minds. So instead of calling it discriminating wisdom, we make it more positive, say individuating wisdom or create. So because Amitabha, the Lotus family, for Avalokiteshvara, Hayagriva, Amitabha, Padmasambhava, they're all in that family. And that is all about being creative in particular such specific situations. So in individual situations. So it's taking the universal, universal connectedness and making something creative out of compassion for others. So I think that's a good thing to say. It's a good, there's nothing negative, therefore, even this, even your distinguishing mind is positive. So I like his translation of that one. It's social talk with Yishigala, this pratyavikshana jnana in Sanskrit. Okay. Because there's everything's good. It's all good. Samantha Bhadra. That's why in the old school they make a big fuss about Samantha Bhadra. Samantha Bhadra means totally good, all around good. Everything is good. Right, Gala? Mm -hmm. And then Samantha Bhadra is in every atom. <laughs> Just a little mini Samantha Bhadras everywhere. <laughs> right? Actually, it's a very amazing. I was just thinking in my own mind last night, thinking about things, that people who think God is omnipotent, you know, get stuck with God as you're putting it, that version of God, they are not compassionate to God. If we have compassion to God, we wouldn't blame him for suffering and evil and by, by, by claiming he's omnipotent. He, he didn't say, I don't know, different gods, they don't really say they're omnipotent, usually. They don't say it. They say, well, I'm trying to do everything nice. They usually say, I love everybody. So that then subconsciously, if they're omnipotent, we have to blame them for, for evil and suffering. So we're not being compassionate to God. That's all. I just was thinking that last night. I was thinking I would write a book about how to be compassionate on God. <laughs> And I thought I might get arrested <laughs> if I do that. Maybe I get arrested. So I better not do that. <laughs> I don't know. I was just thinking that myself. Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay, it's time to go. Thank, thank you, you Gela. Thank you. Can we dedicate the merit? Uh, May we dedicate it. Uh, <laughs> Oh, thank you. So we dedicate the merit. May we all become medicine Buddhas, you talks Buddhas quickly to make everybody else medicine Buddha, like medicine Buddha want to do. I love you talks prayer. You talk prays that he wants to be like a rainstorm of healing. So he wants to have as many you talks as drops of rain that will heal every being suffering. That's so beautiful, Gala. Thank you so much. Thank you. The Bob Thurman Podcast is brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. Menla membership community and listeners like you. 
to learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership and how to support this podcast, please visit our website at thus.org, menla.org, or bobthurman.com. Tashi Delek, and thanks for tuning in.